Hello, Niner faithful, and welcome to the Johnny Dale Football Academy podcast on the channel that's trying to answer the whys and hows of the game. We do that by talking through and dissecting game film and diving deeper to explain why the X's zig and the O's zag. I am Adam, Adam Marino reminding you, as always, the most fun way to watch is on YouTube where we go live. There you can comment into the live show. Be sure to hit the notification bell so you can be a part of the conversation. We also stream live on Facebook and Twitter or X. Also, the audio versions are always found on Spotify and Apple, the usual suspects. You're inside the Johnny Dell Football Academy. Hello, Niner Faithful. Welcome in. Welcome in to all you brownie heads as well. I just made up that name. I don't know if that's literally what they're called. We'll find out. From Quincy Carrier, welcome in. He has a YouTube channel covering the Browns, the AFC North, as well as the entire league. So definitely going to going to have to take a look more at his channel guys very cool thank you quincy for joining us as always joined by mr johnny dell how is everybody doing you know doing great coming off the bye week don't know who's going to play quarterback <laughs> playing against one of the teams of football I mean, how could it not be great you know <laughs> <laughs> you had two weeks to prepare so it should be okay right you feeling good uh, there's some issues on the offensive line with this Browns team. Uh, we want to start there, but I, I think that, you know, it's, it's football, it's the NFL. And I think people underestimate how week to week things can just change. So I think one thing that we want to go over is, uh, the play at quarterback and what the situation is there. So, uh, I'm, we're interested, uh, to, find out your take on what's going on as far as the injuries and, and things like that. I wanted to remind everyone in the chat that <clears throat> remember to hit the hashtag JD49. We are always trying to boost the algorithm. Remember, if you are catching us later than live right now, it could be because you don't have the notification bell clicked over. So make sure you hit the notification bell and make sure you are a part of the conversation. So, yes, as we see the questions coming in, biggest question, who's starting at quarterback for the Browns? Can you shed some light on not only your take on who's going to start, but walk us through a little bit as we don't follow the Browns all the time. How did we get to the point where we, we just kind of assumed a week ago that Deshaun Watson was just going to play and there was no big deal? So walk us through what that looks like. All right, so to, um, the Tuesday after the Titans game, like up until then, we thought everything was fine with him. He didn't look hurt after the game. He just had almost thrown for three, like literally at his best game since he came back um, from from the suspension. And we're, we're thinking things are ticking up, but then we're hearing he's not throwing. Maybe we're just freaking out about that too early. And then you, you hear that he threw, that he didn't throw, and it's like, okay, what is the shoulder injury? And we finally got clarification on whatever it was. It's a shoulder contusion. There's a bone, there's a bruise in the, sh the rotator cuff itself. And the issue isn't that he isn't technically healthy enough to play. I think, and this is my speculation, let me separate this from the actual diagnosis. So that's the diagnosis. That's the medical situation as I understand it. My sure. speculation is that this is a situation where, yes, he can throw the football, but he cannot throw it without altering his throwing motion. And this is something they want to be real careful about because you've seen what's happened when, the, when these guys who are pitchers, quarterbacks, basketball players start to have to alter their motion because of an injury that can lead to more serious problems, right? The extreme example of this is a Markel Fultz where he tried to play through injury and that messed up his shot completely to the point where it's never recovered. Um, so you don't want to give yourself the yips or, or give yourself a mechanical issue long term trying to play early um, through an injury. And it, I understand every week matters, but it's October. 
right? If you mess up in October, you have a lot of time to recover from it. You're but mispronouncing if you mess up, that Brocktober. Brocktober. Oh, Brocktober. My bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? oh, it's geez. Brocktober. So if you mess up in Brocktober, you you'll want to be able to get to no Brock November, I guess we're going to call it, uh, <laughs> or, it, or, or it. wherever we're at. But you'll want to be able to get to that point in the season. I think it, it's just a smarter play. So I think they're just trying to play it safe. I think Watson's trying to make sure that there's not going to be anything bigger that comes out of this than just missing a couple of games. So in my speculation i think you're probably seeing pj walker it looks like that way we haven't really seen deshaun throw for a couple of weeks so i don't think we're gonna go from him not throwing thursday and just doing rehab to suddenly he's ready to play a full game of football on sunday i also wouldn't rule it out but i think that this is something that they should monitor Make sure he's not forcing himself out there early and, and be really careful about because, again, if he develops a more serious issue with this shoulder because you put him out there early, people are going to be critical of him not playing this week. But if you do that, people are going to be extra critical. Oh, my God, how could you do that? They see, that's the Browns being the Browns. So you just got to take a up <laughs> here, right? You know, if, if he's not ready, don't play him um, because the consequences for playing him too early. I mean, this guy, you got a lot invested in whether he's going to be good or not in that contract. And you got to give yourself the best chance to be successful. I I love that you leaned into, you know, that's the Browns being the Browns. (laughs) Um, But I I, I think as 49ers said, we've seen this thing around before with our quarterback, when you have an injury to your throwing shoulder, that suddenly those throws that are gimmies are not gimmies anymore. Mm -hmm. And they can cost you in key moments. And I, I think if if I'm the Browns and I'm looking at my quarterback has not thrown, has not taken reps throwing, and we're going in against this San Francisco defense with those linebackers and those safeties, I'm not sure I want my quarterback where he might throw that launch that ball five yards over somebody's head because, like you said, it's you know sometimes it can be. Uh, in involuntary, you go to throw and there's a pain in there and it makes you flinch and that ball sails. That happens against this team. You're looking at a, at a turnover. And you know, we were talking about before the show, when you have a defense that Cleveland has, the biggest thing you're going to be pounding on is do not turn the ball over. Do not mm-hmm. put our defense in a bad position because we have a great defense. We think that's where we're going to win the game. Offense, do not turn the ball over. And so if I'm the Browns, I'm looking at this and, and like you said, Watson has not thrown for a couple of weeks and I'm trying to game plan against this defense and we're, we got to be on our keys and on our landmarks and we're going to be practicing that all week. I'm not sure how I feel about even if the talent disparity is there of a guy coming in cold and trying to hit those landmarks um, coming off this. So I, I think uh, from what you're describing, I would be, I would be surprised if Watson plays. That's just kind of reading the tea leaves. Yeah, that's where I'm at, too. Key factor for sure is going to be quarterback play. But Quincy, what do you see? You mentioned the offensive line. Is that your biggest key? What else do you see for the game? I think the Browns have had a hard time adjusting to the fact that they're not in 2020 anymore. And I think what I mean by this is Nick Chubb's not walking through those double doors in this game. And this offensive line is not the offensive line we all remember from 2020, where they were like, you know, EPA above everybody Ooh, by like 20 percent. Yeah, just incredible offensive line. That's not the world we live in anymore. It was impressive. Um, yeah. Yeah. With this offensive line, Jed Wills has regressed a little bit. Um, I think a little bit's putting it nicely. He's He's been he's regressed pretty badly. Um, Joe Batonio, he's only two years older. Wyatt Taylor hasn't been the same guy there. Um, it's really along the interior. I think you had more problems. Jed has been kind of predictable in how he gets beat. He's real easy to beat inside and he'll have these streaks where he just gets beat pretty badly, but that's kind of like predictable. So you can build around that. But the other stuff, like the interior stuff, Joe Batonio and, and why tell Ethan Pulsick not being good in the interior, that's been really what's been killing you. Um, and their blocking in the run game, I think, has been especially bad. And I think this is where they're living in that, hey, we thought we had, well, when we had Nick Chubb, it's not a problem, right? Because they're so eager to get upfield because they're used to Nick Chubb's going to break that first tackle. It don't matter who we let through. We could let a three tech through. He's going to slide off it. And then we're, we're going to get to that second level. He's going to get like 20, 30 yard chunk. Well, Nick Chubb's not running the ball anymore. Jerome yeah. Ford is not Nick Chubb. 
nor is Kareem Hunt. So now when you're eager to get upfield, instead of like Nick Chubb maybe breaking one for seven, maybe breaking one for 17, now it's you're down in the backfield <laughs> and you just lost two yards. Um, I think they need to simplify it for the running backs that they have in there. You know, again, you can't live as if you have Nick Chubb. I think inside zone is going to have to be something that they take more advantage of, just simplifying it, making it guard center guard, you know, just <laughs> running behind that, seeing what you could do with that. Um, and just simplifying the game in, in total because you just need to find a way to get four yard chunks out of this run game. And right now that hasn't been the case. Um, and I think that's just overall, when you look at this Browns offense, it is a adjustment to not having Nick Chubb. And I say this all the time to people who tell me running backs don't matter. This is not <laughs> what happens when a player who does not matter gets hurt, right? It, it, people want to tell me, oh, you can just plug somebody in there. Nick Chubb will be fine. No, when you have a running back, the caliber of a Christian McCaffrey, a Nick Chubb, or a uh, Derrick Henry, these guys are your offense. Um, and when they go out, there's a massive adjustment that needs to be made because you're no longer running the ball with that guy. So how you run the ball, when you run the ball, how you block to run the ball, all of that changes. And I think they're adjusting to that change because Nick Chubb was just so phenomenal. I mean, when Nick Chubb was still healthy, this same offensive line is not playing that great right now. They were they, Nick Chubb was getting seven, eight yards to carry. So that just tells you what the difference is there, right? It, it's not rocket science, science. It's just, hey, we're not blocking for Nick Chubb anymore. Some of these habits we've built up blocking for Nick Chubb the last five years, they got to change. Yeah. You, 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 I, we've seen that with San Francisco people almost before Christian McCaffrey came along because you just see running backs get plugged in and the run game would have success. And then you see Christian McCaffrey come in and that success goes to another stratosphere. And people always say, because I remember when we, when, when the word first started going out that the Panthers were looking at maybe trading a few players. I was pounding the table for Christian McCaffrey. I was, I was going on people's shows that I know. And, and I was like, dude, we have got to get Christian McCaffrey. Like that would be an absolute dream in this offense. People go, I don't know. I don't know with what he's getting paid and getting right. that draft he's, capital. He's injured I'm sometimes. Not, he's got uh, injury history. I just don't see a running back being worth that. That's what I heard over and over and over again. If we're going to get some, I'd prefer a Brian Burns. I'd prefer JC Horn. And I would say, no, you don't understand Christian McCaffrey in this offense will take this offense to another stratosphere like it will it will be a massive difference if you mm -hmm. ah, for three weeks this was happening and then we traded for Christian McCaffrey and I lost my mind like I when I remember it was a Thursday night when that happened the, the news broke I stayed up for four hours watching Christian McCaffrey film because I was so excited I put a video out on it the next day and you've seen the San Francisco offense just become electric since then from the time he came onto this team, the average points per game jumped 10 points from when Christian McCaffrey joined the team. And we have, it's like 30 points is just routine anymore mm -hmm. when you have, when yeah. you have a running back like that. And Nick Chubb was that guy for Cleveland. And so, I mean, that was, I, 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 I wish I could get the image of that knee injury out of my head. Um, that was one of the most brutal injuries I've ever seen. And like I said, he's not walking through that door and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that does change everything. So if you're Cleveland, because I, I kind of look at this, like when we played, uh, Arizona, one thing I said before that game, I said, Arizona's best chance is going to be if they can stay on schedule, they've got to find a way to get three yards, four yards, every single play minimum. Like you can't have these minus one yard plays. It'll kill a drive because there's just a talent disparity there between their offense, our defense. And so for them, it's got to be about staying on schedule. And you, you look at the two big drives that Arizona had in that game against us. And 90% of their plays on those drives was three, four yard gains. That was it. It was just little chip, 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 chip working your way. And then they could hit maybe an explosive, but it was all about having to stay on schedule. And so if you're, if you're the offensive coordinator for, or if you're Stefanski for uh, the Browns and you're looking at this San Francisco defense, where are you looking that you might be able to attack to stay on schedule? Yeah, it's, that's a tough one, right? Because the 49ers have Fred Warner and I think that he's probably the best linebacker in football. Um, 
And he's just so versatile and takes away some of that easy stuff, right? When it's like, oh, okay, we want to throw a screen here to catch him off guard. Fred Warner could be there uh, and ruin your day. So it's going to be difficult. The play action stuff that they used in the past to kind of get these easy yards. I think you're even seeing it with um, with Shanahan that he's gone away from some of that play action stuff that he used to be heavy on, right? Where it's not the same percentage uh, that it used to be because the league's just kind of adjusted to it. So that's been one of the things that Stefanski's been struggling to figure out how to get those easy yards. I think the answer's in the RPO game. I mean, you have Deshaun, you have PJ Walker as a backup. I think the RPO should be a big part of how you get those little easy dink and dunk plays. I'm pretty sure that had a lot to do with, with, with what Josh Dobbs was doing on the 49ers, right? Is that ability to run, ability to move, or at least the threat to run, to open up other things. Um, so I think that will be something that they could do there. Uh, Elijah Moore has to become a bigger part of this offense when it comes to him just running routes. So, you know, I think they have this whip route that they run with him, that he kills every corner he runs it against. And they never throw it. It drives me crazy where they have this whip route set up. And it's a whip route, so you know the eyes are supposed to be there, at least initially. And, and you just see the whip route happen, and you're like, he's open, nobody threw it. All right. You know what I mean? Those are easy ways to get, you know, a couple yards here and there, right? You know, you get somebody on angle, maybe you miss a tackle, you get 15, get a chunk out of it. David Njoku's another piece that they can use to kind of get chunks. They love those tight end screens on the inside. I don't know how successful they'll be this week, but they love to do them. And they're successful most of the time. Um, I think that's kind of, yeah, I think that's kind of one of those things that they have to kind of focus on. It's like, okay, we don't have to shine. But we do have Elijah Moore. We do have David Njoku. We do have Amari Cooper. Focus on finding ways to get those guys the ball. Just small, easy chunks. Um, and I think that would be the strategy going forward because other than that, I mean, like when Jerome Ford ain't going to win you this game, right? Um, P.J. Walker is not going to win you this game. You have to look elsewhere for that success. And to jump on the point that you were talking about with the Chris McCaffrey thing, it is funny how we talk about $15 million differently given the position because well, that's what Chris McCaffrey's at, like 15. If people talk about that, like it's crazy. Odell got like 13 and a half and nobody cares. <laughs> like, I think right. what? D Hop just got 17. Um, uh, I was looking at Corey Davis had 15 and a half where he retired. So it's like, it, it's just hilarious to me when people like talk about running back money. Oh, you can't give them that. That nobody actually brings up the money. Jonathan Taylor was holding out for $12 million or something like that. It's like, that's yeah. nothing. That is so nothing a year. Like, why are we? This is a Christian what? Kirk. Christian yeah. Kirk for someone, right? Like, come on. Yeah. Like, look at the running backs. Nick Chubb and Derrick Henry make $12.5 million. They are easily the most difficult thing to defend on their team. Meanwhile, like, Ryan Tannehill gets, like, $40 million or something like that. Like, something right. crazy. Danny it's Dimes. Like, How about that? We're, we're so locked into this paradigm where we're like, oh, well, it's the position. And on some levels, it does matter, right? The position really does matter. But when you get so locked into it, that you're just giving guys this money because you're like, oh, well, he plays wide receiver, so that makes sense. We're just going to give him this $30 million instead of evaluating <laughs> how impactful is this guy to the team? Like, Tyreek Hill is worth $30 million. He happens to play wide receiver. But if Tyreek Hill were the same player and he played running back, he's still worth $30 million because he's really hard to tackle. Uh, and he's really hard to not to stop getting the ball in the end zone, right? He's just difficult to stop. And sometimes we just lose sight of like, okay, what's actually impactful to the game? And what do we just, based on the way we've always been doing it, feels impactful. And that's how you end up complaining about Christian McCaffrey's $15 million. Meanwhile, you can sign um, Marquez Valdez-Scantling to $20 million and nobody blinks an eye. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it's cr it, 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 I think you nail it because I, I look around the league and I go, how did we get here? We're running backs as talented as they can be. And with the, the punishment that their body, I think it's one of those that I think running backs are turning around and looking at the league and saying, you're actually devaluing us because of what you're doing to us. Because, you know, it becomes about this running backs have a shelf life. And it's a shorter shelf life because of the nature of their position of the wear and tear on the body. And they're going, you're actually paying us less when we're walking away with the game with probably more issues than 
as far as joint issues and and body issues than a lot of these other guys because we have taken so many more hits. I mean, a running back average on a season is going to take 400 hits. I mean, even if he runs the ball 350 times, there's going to be he's going to take more than one hit on a lot of these runs. And, and think so about he's that take like, 400, 450 hits. I mean, that's a lot think, of hits. A wide receiver is going to get hit maybe 80 times. You know, think if, about he's, that. if he's really good. Think about that. We give the running back to football sometimes 25 to 30 times a game. The only other guy we give that much responsibility is the quarterback, right? Like that is an insane amount of responsibility to have over a game. And then when people turn around and tell me that the guy that you trust to get the ball 30 times in a game is not somebody worth half of what the quarterback's making, I'll answer thing. But we're willing to give it to somebody who might get 12 targets? Like – like exactly. if he catches eight of them, he's good. Like I, it's it's one of those things where I'm like sometimes we can get so deep into the numbers that we forget that like football is a game that you have to watch and you have to just be able to see the impact. And it's like I promise you, I if you put a pecking list on in in front of Kevin Stefanski's office and of guys he needs to have right in order to be successful, a good quarterback is always going to be one. But then you have Miles Garrett, Nick Chubb. That's it. No, that's the top three. But if you look at the salary cap, those are not the top three highest paid guys. Yeah, like Juan Thornhill gets more money than him. Um, you know, Denzel Ward gets more money than him, and they're all important. But I think we just kind of have lost. We got so wrapped up into this like conversation of like. How much well, should running backs get paid? And we don't even talk about how much they actually don't get paid right now, even the really good ones. And I think that kind of clouded the whole conversation because it's like people are literally making the argument that you should never pay a running back past a rookie deal. I think that's a ridiculous argument to make because that is that is silly. <laughs> and and that's, that's a that's a good way to get no running back to want to stay at running back. I mean, like you said, J Jonathan Taylor was holding up for twelve million dollars. And I, I look at that and, and, and that where I put that in perspective is we had our right tackle walk this last year and goes get signed by the Broncos, Mike McGlinchey and fans, fans hated Mike McGlinchey. I mean, he was, he was the guy that people would bag on because every single game there was, there was going to be a clip put on Twitter of him getting absolutely demolished. Just so he's Jay I mean, Wills. <laughs> yeah. I mean, now 90% of the time he was pretty good. I think he, he ended up grading out as, as like the, the 12th best right tackle in the league, something like that. There's always somebody on the team yeah, he that gets signed like a, a disproportionate with, amount of the hate. He he signed a deal with Denver that was seventeen and a half million dollars a year, and you're and I'm sitting here. I'm just thinking about okay, uh, we've seen the impact of a Christian McCaffrey on this team, and Jonathan Taylor is a similar kind of player. I'm, I I I think there's not that much of a disparity between Jonathan Taylor and Christian McCaffrey as far as their ability to carry the ball. Jonathan Taylor is a very very good running back, and I'm sitting here going. Is that really worth five and a half, two thirds of what Mike McGlinchey got? And I'm going, no, no, there's no way. You can't tell me that Jonathan Taylor would not have a bigger impact on the Broncos than Mike McGlinchey would have. <laughs> and Mike McGlinchey's making five and a half million dollars more than what Jonathan Taylor has had to fight for. And, the, and so, yeah. The, the, the Daniel Jones contract is like peak. Okay, we need to stop just being so strict on positional value because – People will defend that contract because he plays quarterback. Well, I'm like, you gave Daniel Jones $40 million, but you out here haggling over $10 million with Saquon Barkley? Like, yeah. that doesn't make any sense to me. You drafted one number two overall. You valued this guy in the middle of the first round. How do you how do you do the calculus on this where it's like, oh, yeah, Daniel Jones is worth it because he plays quarterback. But it's like, you know he ain't good. You know, because if they thought he was good, they would have signed him to like a five-year deal. They signed him like a two-year deal that they could get out of because they were like, okay, we know you ain't good, but you might be all right, right? And that's the thing. I'm like, you're going to sign a quarterback that you know, you know is going to hold you back in the postseason because they're a quarterback, but you will refuse to pay a running back who makes that quarterback much more livable because he's a running back. And then people will defend it and say, hey, it makes sense. Daniel Jones plays quarterback. Saquon plays running back. But he's not good at quarterback. <laughs> and then you'll have people tell me this. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? Daniel Jones can play quarterback for the next 40 until he's 40. Okay. Do you want Daniel Jones to be your quarterback until he's 40? 
that's not a world I want to live in. What does it matter? I don't want to play a quarterback for me right now, and he's 27. Why would I care if he could play till he's 40? Nobody wants that. So why are you paying for it? Just because he plays quarterback. That And the funniest thing about the Daniel Jones one is he's his best attribute. His best thing about him is he can run. What are we doing? Right, that, what are we talking about? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah, you, you, you won't pay a running back who can run, but you'll play a quarterback who can't throw but can run. Uh, you, make you, that make you sense. won't pay make one of the best sense. running backs in the game that can run, catch, block, all these things, but you're going to pay your quarterback because he can run. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. Like, they should both be worth, like, what? $20 million, right? Like, I think <laughs> that's a fair $40 million for both of them. Nobody's complaining, but you pay it 40 for one. For and one. then you tell Saquon he got to settle for 10. That's crazy. You know, uh, just sticking with the, the offensive side of the ball, one, one matchup I'm, as far as what I've seen on tape, that I'm really excited about. And now, now you did, you said, you know, he's taken a little bit of a step back this year, but has historically been one of the best guards in the game. That's Joel Batonio and the matchup of him on Javon Hargrave. He was the big mm. free agent signing of the 49ers this year, Javon Hargrave. And he has been a monster and he, he always lines up over the defensive or the offensive left guard. And so you're going to get Batonio on Hargrave. And, th- and that's a, a matchup that I think is going to be one of those that, Unless fans are were clued into that as a, as something to watch, we aren't going to notice it. But I think that might be as far as along the, the defensive line, offensive line for Cleveland, um, one of the best matchups to watch in this game. I think if if there's a matchup that I'm I'm excited and and I think that you're going to get most of your one on one opportunities. I think they'll trust Batonio on Hargrave more than they'll trust either their tackles on Bosa. Um, and and I, I think if they're looking at we got a slide to because usually Hargrave is on the opposite side of Bosa. Hargrave's gonna be on the offense's left, Bosa's usually on the offense's right. And so usually you're gonna see line slides to the right uh to help over there where Bosa is. And so, you know, I think that's where you have a chance for one-on-ones. That's gonna be an interesting matchup. How do you how do you think that's gonna go? Well, it's funny because they have familiarity with each other because uh, Hargrave used to be with the Steelers, but he was a completely different player in Pittsburgh. They had him kind of like yeah. one gap in, <laughs> back then. Um, one of the rare instances of Mike Tomlin not knowing what he's had um, and, and losing him in the thing, but they've done that a couple times where like they, the funniest thing is that they did not want to bet on Hargrave, but then they bet on Tyson Alawahu the next season, which was a choice uh, by them. But yeah, it's... It's going to be a good matchup. Look, Joel had a bad game against the Ravens. He usually bounces back pretty well, and I don't think he's done. Um, and I think usually a, the bad game kind of gets him back on. The issue with him is that, you know, he's not healthy right now. He was last seen in crutches during the bye week. I don't know what that means. He had, like, some kind of knee injury. Um, so he's not 100% healthy. I'm not 100% sure he'll play, and if he doesn't, then they were throwing Luke Whipler at over somebody like that. And that's going to be a little bit of a problem there. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I worry about this offensive line's health coming into this game just because Joe's kind of questionable right now. Um, David Ajoku, who's a really good blocker at tight end, somebody who could help you. Um, if you're either of those tackles going up against those battles, I think that's somebody who is also questionable for this game. If we want to talk about the rest of the offensive line, the only guy I haven't complained about all season is Dewan Jones. He's good. He's really, really good. Big guy who can move his feet well. I think the guys that give him trouble are those twitchy bend a corner guys that could just blow by him. Uh, but he did a real good job against TJ Watt, who likes to run down the middle of your chest and bull rush you a lot. He's just too big for all that. Um, so it's gonna be interesting also to see if you know, he gets to go up against Nick Bosa, how Nick Bosa handles that one, right? Because Nick Bosa, from what I know, I know he can, he's twitchy, he's fast, he's athletic, and he has all those skills as well. But he's more of a, I want to manhandle you, kind of get through you um, kind of guy too. So I wonder how that's going to hold up for him. Also going to be another great test for Dewan Jones um, in the NFL. But he's already gone against TJ. And I think that you, you go up against TJ and Miles in practice, like you might be, you you might be more prepared than the average person <laughs> to go up yeah. against a Nick Bosa. Yeah, I mean that that's pretty that's pretty good, uh, pretty good competition. Uh, we got a super chat here. Want to give a shout out to Lisa, big fan of or uh, friend of the channel. Lisa, thank you for your super chat. She says she's still mad that Dable got Coach of the Year 
and not Kyle Shanahan last year. Yeah, Brian Dable got coach of the year last year over Kyle Shanahan, who made it to the NFC Championship game on his third quarterback in the last pick in the draft. Brian Dable should have got agent of the year because he got right. Brian, Daniel Jones $40 million a year. Like he better yeah. have gotten his 7%. From that, that was like a heist. Yeah. He got heist of the year. And 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 now you see what the Giants are doing this year, and you, you're going I, – I mean, I, I don't know. I've watched some of these Giants games. And I mean, Who not did to make not see Giants that show, but... coming, too? Like, it was like everybody was watching that Giants year. It was like, oh, we know what's about to happen next year, but the Giants kept operating as if that wasn't obvious to everybody. And it was like, what are you doing? We all know what's about to happen. Trade him. Get, don't do this. You don't have to do this. Man. This is the same thing that happened with the Browns and Derek Anderson. Everybody knew it was a fluke when Derek Anderson had that one good year in 2007. And every. But everybody but the Browns were operating as if that was a fluke. And it's like, yo, what are you doing, man? You know, Daniel, you've seen it for three years, enough to not give him a fifth-year option on a quarterback. You know how literally they got to believe in you not to give you a fifth-year option? They gave Baker Mayfield the fifth-year option, okay? Like, they, they gave Sam Darnold the fifth-year option. You know how little they have to believe in you? Like, in order to not give – and then you just have a decent season where it's obvious what's going on, and they're like, yep, 40 mil. How did they not see that coming? I don't know. When you start comparing it with Baker Mayfield in there, they didn't even give you what Baker Mayfield got. Uh, that's 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 pretty. That's something. God, Sam Darnold, three years into his career, got the fifth year option. Sam yeah. Darnold, we knew what oh, that oh. was in year two. <laughs> oh yeah, we we. I mean, he's our backup. We we know about Sam. By the way, shout uh, out to the Panthers. They had them both on the fifth year options like last year. <laughs> like, I don't know how that happens. How do you have two guys with the same draft all their fifth year option as and, your and, starter and your backup? <laughs> and 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 both guys were top three picks in the draft. And, and both guys got and both guys got usurped by PJ Walker. Yeah, and, and both of them got moved on. Uh, they they didn't even end up with either one of them, and ended up you know with uh, one of the top picks in the draft again. It's like how many top picks at quarterback are you gonna throw? And they took the wrong guy. They took Anthony Richardson or CJ Stroud, but that's a whole another conversation. I live in I live in Alabama. I live in Alabama, so I say roll tide. Uh, I'll I'll root Look, Bryce is the coldest college football quarterback I've ever seen. But did you see him standing next to these NFL players? You're like, ooh, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. He's not fast <laughs> like Kyler. Like, I don't know how yeah. this is going to work itself out because he's small. Did you see Anthony Richardson? And he makes his offensive line look tidy. And you're like, well, that can work, right? <laughs> or CJ Stroud, <laughs> who's just out here one-handed tossing balls now. Like, like, like he's and not a fifth-year Yeah, he's he, crazy. He's not throwing picks. I mean, that that's crazy for what he's doing. With a bad old line and not that great of a wide receiving core. Like, hey, they, he might be something yeah i, th I think uh D'Amico ryan's is doing a really good job down there in houston um you know but i, I can all our players <laughs> yeah I, i'm i'm just thinking about you know talking about all this talent as being being thrown at positions i think one thing when you look at when i turned on the browns tape and you start looking through their roster one thing that just jumps out at you is how much talent they have stocked up with on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, there's a lot of high draft picks. There's a lot of talent over there. Um, and, and it shows on film. It reminds me very much. Stefanski has taken a very similar uh, route to building his team that Kyle Shanahan did, which was Kyle Shanahan. When he first got here, it was almost like we were the, the, a big bag of rocks on offense where it was just the the bargain bin they weren't going after anything big on that side as far as you know kyle use was the big signing the fullback he was the big <laughs> signing on offense uh that's not saying anything bad about use check i love i love juice um but he was the big signing that's how depleted the offensive side was and kyle shannon was going out there in in his first year spends First round for like the number three overall pick on Solomon Thomas, and then trades back into the first round to get Reuben Foster, a linebacker out of out of Alabama. You know, neither of those picks worked out. You know, but that was their very first draft that they they went first round both sides on defense. And then you mm -hmm. look at their their first picks in the draft for most of their time. You're looking at Solomon Thomas, Reuben Foster, uh, a couple of years later, Nick Bosa, and then you got um, you got. Javon Kinlaw, you know, these are guys that are coming in that they're bringing in as their, 
their top picks in the draft that they really load up on that side of the ball. You look at the big free agent signings and you're looking at, you know, they traded for D Ford and they signed Javon Hargrave and they signed Charvarius Ward. And, and then they've built the defensive side through Fred Warner, Drake Greenlaw that you're looking at. They have just loaded up talent on the defensive side of the ball. It's been a invest, invest, invest there. And I think when when you look at two defenses that remind you a lot of each other, I, I think Cleveland and San Francisco really do remind you a lot of each other. They're both highly talented defenses. And so uh, introduce us a little bit to maybe some of the guys we don't know as much about on this defense. Because uh, I think everybody knows about Miles Garrett. I mean, dude's just a freak and uh, all of us know about Denzel Ward, you know, as a guy that has been one of the best lockdown corners in this league for a number of years now. Um, but who are some of those guys that maybe we don't know as much about? Yeah. So the number one guy on that list is Grant Delpit. Um, I think the last time a lot of people really talked about Grant Delpit was his days in LSU. He's a much different player than what people projected him to be in draft, right? People thought he was going to be this true free safety that you could move around. He could play a little bit in the corner. What he is for the Browns is more of a, a extra linebacker and a strong safety, right? He's somebody who can come in there and, and really stick to these run fits, tackle really well, and then come in and cover a tight end or a corner if he need be. Uh, and I think that Grant Delpit, he's the, to me, he's been the second best player on this defense when they've been rolling. Um, somebody who's been really good. If the Browns are playing well on that side of the ball, you'll hear Grant Delpit, Grant Delpit all day. Um, he's been one of their best pieces there. JOK is another one who, again, a guy who had a lot of draft hype coming out, slipped to the second round because of size. He's really done a good job now that he has a decent defensive line in front of him of being able to duck around some of these blocks and really being able to blow up some of those wider, you know, those wide zone run plays. Or, um, you know, if you throw a lot of screens, this is not the team to throw screens against, right? The Browns are really good against these screens um, for the most part when they're tackling well. So I think speed from the linebacker position that you're going to see in this game from JLK and Grant Delpit, that's something that I think not a lot of people are super aware of when they hear about Cleveland Browns um, and Martin Emerson. You, know, you talked about Greg Newsom, former first round pick. We talked about Denzel Ward, top five pick. Those guys should be good. But Gre Martin Emerson, I mean, there was talking kept that he might be the best corner of them all um, because he definitely plays that style that you love to see corners play, right? A real physical guys like to comp him to like, um, play style wise is like a Richard Sherman type, right? Real physical, uses his length and just disruptive, right? He's the catch is never made on him until it completely made. He's gonna poke, run, grab, all that kind of stuff to kind of force the incompletion. He's really good at that kind of stuff. Um, and I think he is somebody who kind of gets slept on a little bit, but on the right matchup. He's a really good piece. And it's going to be interesting to see who they're going to throw at Brandon Ayuk, who they're going to throw at uh, Debo Samuel. Because if I were to point out a wide receiver combo that matches up perfectly with the Browns as far as like it's an advantage for them, it's the Cincinnati Bengals, right? Their wide receiver equivalent for Denzel Ward is obviously Jamar Chase. Um, speed there, recovery there, everything's kind of equal there. And then you have a guy like T. Higgins, who's kind of more of an all-round guy that's exactly who Greg Newsom is as a corner. And you have Tyler Boyd, who's more of a physical third down specialist, and that's where Martin Emerson is. That's kind of the lane that these three occupy just on the opposite side of the ball. And I think that um, those three, especially the other two, not Denzel Ward, those are the ones that hold it down. And again, in run support, Greg Newsom also really good at run support. So those are the guys, the little guys, the safeties. You're going to see a lot of guys in their 20, their number 20 or single digits that are making tackles on run plays. And that's just kind of how this defense operates. And that's how, how they're being successful. They don't really like to throw their base package out there a ton. Um, so they're going to be in a lot of nickel. So I think that that's one of the things. Grant Delpit, if, if you don't know, that's going to be one of the names. If this defense plays well, you're going to see a good performance from Grant Delpit. You know, and I, lo I love that uh, from that perspective, because one thing that Kyle Shanahan will always do if he sees and, and I've, I've told people this when I watch film of our upcoming opponent and I see a corner that's not willing to tackle, I go, I promise you, Kyle Shanahan is going to eat that guy alive. They are going to run toss crack. They're going to run wide zone toss. They're going to run 
bubble screens that way. They're going to run reverses at him. They will literally bring every single kind of running play at him that they can to make that corner tackle. Uh, because if they see any hesitancy, they are pressing those corners. Nobody, I think, I've seen around the league forces corners to tackle in the run game and get phys gets physical like the 49ers do. They have done it for years. Uh, that's one reason why the Rams actually lost, have lost nine regular season games in a row to us is because their corners, uh, they do not tackle well. And Kyle constantly attacks them. He goes after them every single game. And until that changes for LA, I don't see LA really getting advantage. The only time they had an advantage was when our quarterback uh, shoulder was hanging out off its out of its socket. And uh, we had about 90% of the team banged up um, and they still barely won that game. Um, but yeah, cause we yeah. dropped an interception that hit us like in, in the, the it was a punt. It, we dropped a punt. It was ridiculous, yeah. but you know, so I think that's an area where <laughs> Cleveland's defense, man, tip your hat that's going to be a struggle um as far as for the, for the 49ers offense and i think if there's going to be any success they're going to have to try and run it between the tackles which is not the bread and butter of our running game um but against a wide nine front and when you have physical guys on the outside that kind of leaves you as a you know take the path of least resistance and that that seems to be that yeah, and especially yeah. with Christian McCaffrey, how fast he can get downhill. And then you're going to be moving around miles a lot. So there's going to be a lot of gaps that open themselves up. I think that's going to be the test. Hey, can the secondary – it's one thing you can tackle some of these guys that you've tackled before, right? Even like a Derrick Henry who – we know the book is on him. As long as he doesn't get downhill, he's kind of like, I don't want to say easy to tackle, but he's a lot easier to tackle than people assume, right? If you get him before he gets downhill. The same thing's true about Nick Chubb. Um, but – if they're able to, you know, if Christian McCaffrey's able to make guys miss in this game, who is going to be a problem, right? <laughs> because then he's going to have a lot of space because the way that Jim Schwartz likes to create pressure, it's going to create some gaps for him, right? He's going to have some spots. It's about can that first guy get him? If that doesn't happen, then Christian McCaffrey might go off for a big day. But that's going to be the question. I think he's going to test and see, hey, look, you're going to throw smaller guys at us. You're going to try to have these corners tackle. I'm going to see if we can beat you. I think that's going to be definitely what he's going to spam in that first that drive, see if he could get that on the Browns. Uh, if he's successful, he's going to go back to that well. If he's not, then Kyle's going to adjust, put guys in motion, try to get guys rubbed on. I mean, not rubbed on, but, you know, try to get guys out of position, switch them out the run fits, do some of the stuff that Baltimore was doing, see if that works. You know, it's a, it's it's people come into football games and sometimes they have the assumption is like they're running this plan and this is the only plan. But it's more like an experiment, right, where it's like, OK, I think this will work against him. You try it out. Did that work? No. Why did that not work? Let's go to the thing. OK, this guy's out of position. Okay, get that guy to be in position, find somebody who can, maybe that'll work. Did that work? No. Okay, because they're just too fast. All right, let's try this. Let's try to get him out of position like that. And it's just a constant tinkering, and it's a constant adjustment of like, okay, doing this and seeing if you could beat him around this. And it's not this strict plan, especially on defense, of what you want to do to beat somebody. It's just like, hey, this isn't working. Okay, let's try this. Okay, that ain't working. Let's do this. Then that, that, that it's a constant game of whack-a-mole um, for, for these offensive and defensive coordinators. And that's kind of how you look at it because you'll hear people like, oh, the game plan was terrible. Like, what? They didn't like, they didn't like sit there and be like, oh, yeah, we're going to purposely not tackle on the outside. Like, that's not <laughs> how that happened. Right. But it's, hey, we can't do that. They're forcing us to do that. And sometimes you got nothing to force them out of that. Right, like nothing to force him out of that can can stop it without causing a bigger problem. So you just got to deal with the bleeding. So you know it's it's always interesting to see that kind of chess battle. Um, and I think this is going to be a fascinating one because Jim Schwartz has familiarity with Kyle Shan, vice versa. They've gone up against yep. each other plenty of times, and. I think it's going to be fascinating to see <laughs> how they prepare for each other, knowing that this is going to be the matchup that tights the game, right? If the Browns can do some things to confuse Brock Purdy, maybe get some pressure on him, force him into some bad throws and take advantage of that, maybe get an interception here or there, that's going to turn the game in their favor. But also Kyle knows if I'm able to neutralize this defense, PJ Walker don't scare me enough. Or, you know, even if it's Deshaun without Nick Chubb, I don't think that scares him enough to feel like, that's going to cost him the game. So that's where all the attention is going to be at in this game because that's going to be what wins or loses this, right? Yeah, I don't think we're going to expect 
much from the Bucs offense in this game. Um, it'd be shocking if they like go for like 300 just by themselves because they're just truly beating them. I don't think that's a real possibility, but it's going to be about the position that the defense puts the offense in for the entire game. Can they get favorable field position? Can they get some easy f- field goal uh, drives? Can they get some easy touchdown drives? That's going to be the stuff that's going to put this game in the winnable range for the Cleveland Browns. Yeah, love that. You mentioned the the chess match with Schwartz and Shanahan. You mentioned Brock Purdy. And I want to give you some love here, Quincy, because I will say that the chat – is responding to you the way that I have not seen them respond to another content creator that we bring in from another team. And so real quick, I'm going to ask you about, about Brock Purdy, but I want you to give the details of your, uh, of your show, the name of your YouTube, because I want people to be able to lock into what you're doing. And then we'll, we'll talk some Brock Purdy. Yeah. Just search Quincy Q U I N C Y carrier. Just how you think it's spelled C A R R I E R. Um, did y'all used to have Adam Carrier on your team? I feel like y'all had a carrier on, on the 49ers for a while. Mm, chat. Uh, I think it was a know. tight end. Maybe he was a tight end. Um, uh, it sa- that name sounds familiar. It might have been uh, a Bronco. I'm not sure. But it, 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 we, we had maybe a carrier. It's just a Shanahan it, Adam. It. it was. It was. Uh, oh, it was an edge rusher, wasn't it? Oh, gosh. Yeah. I know. I know that we had a carrier familiar. on your team. Yeah, yeah, I feel like it was, but. So you spell it just like that, yeah. Yeah, C-A-R-R-I-E-R. Search that on YouTube. All my projects will pop up if you want to check that out. I do a lot on my main channel about the Browns. I also cover um, the the rest of the NFL and the AFC North um, with some of my other projects. So check it out. Awesome. So everyone in the chat, make sure that you check out Quincy. We're going to ask a few more questions here, but um, a reminder as well to – like and share as we're trying to grow the channel so that we can have other great guests like Quincy. Cause here's the deal. Quincy would not even check our DMS if he looked and saw that we had 18 subscribers. So the way that we build this and we get people like a Jerry Rice possibly, or someone like that is we grow this thing, right? So make sure you're hitting the notification bell. My favorite way to grow this channel is to go up to people wearing Niners gear, show them my phone, pull up YouTube and, and show them my ugly face. No show the breakdown videos, obviously that what Johnny does, that's the biggest way that we can, that we can grow this thing. So thank you to Quincy. You mentioned Brock Purdy. Let's get back into it. I want to know from a perspective of someone who isn't a diehard Niner fan, we, we are going to allow that for today that you're not a diehard Niner fan. So we want your perspective on, What you think Cleveland thinks of Brock Purdy, is he a system quarterback? We've gone back and forth on this show many a time. The chat knows that we have just gone off on a tangent about this. What's your take on Brock Purdy? Is he just a system quarterback or is he legit? See, I don't think he's fully a system quarterback because you see what Kyle used to call with Jimmy. And it's not the same confidence that Ooh. he calls it with, with, with Brock, Thank right? You. Like there were times where he was just scared to death of Jimmy oh, throwing the, chat's the ball. Gonna love you. The like, chat is going to love you, there, Quincy. <laughs> yeah. So there were, there were times where you could just tell like, okay, he doesn't trust the quarterback. That's not necessarily the case that you get with Brock Purdy. My thing though, and this might not be super popular with the chat. My thing with the Kyle Shanahan system has been no matter like he always puts together a good offense, but there always seems to be something he hits his head up against. Um, and it might be just because he's so strict on that system and that if a team forces them to adjust, it becomes a little bit of a problem for the Shanahan system. Uh, but that's more of an issue for like, once you get to the NFC championship or the Super Bowl, right. Um, for that. And I think Kyle's, he can, he can take a lot of guys, a lot of different places. My big question is, can he finally get over that hump? and win a Super Bowl with one of these guys, or is it going to take a little bit of an adjustment period? Because sometimes when he does get somebody who can improvise or wants to improvise a little bit more, that's where you see the Shanahan magic don't really work, right? You know, it, it really didn't work with RG3. You look at the guys he's he's disliked, publicly disliked. <laughs> RG3, Johnny Manziel, and I mean, it's pretty obvious he wasn't the biggest fan of Trey Lance, right? Or else you don't trade him for a fifth-round pick. Um, and... 
you look at all three of those guys, what they have in common was that they play off script at times, right? And Trey Lance is hard to pin down. I, I went to Youngstown State, so I see a lot of North Dakota State, and I still didn't see him play that much football. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, he barely played even at that level. So it's hard to pin him down exactly what his issues are and weren't um, in the NFL because I don't think his college sample size is a good enough thing to go off of. But you look at, like, RG3, you look at Johnny Manziel. Johnny Manziel is obviously an extreme of this super off script, right? Dunny read the playbook off script. Oh he gosh. had Kyle Shadhead's playbook and never opened it. That's incredible to me. <laughs> that, that's a true story when it comes to Johnny Manziel. But that's the truth about him, right? Like he just does not love these guys who are going to go off script. And to his credit, Brock Purdy does go off script at times, and he seems to be more comfortable with that. But I think in order to get that kind of quarterback play that's going to win you a Super Bowl, you need to be comfortable with that guy being able to get out of structure and and make some plays outside of that structure. But as far as Brock goes, like, yeah, he's clearly an upgrade to Jimmy Garoppolo. But yeah. I don't know how y'all are. I was I am one of those who was always low on Jimmy Garoppolo. <laughs> so I get it. Um, yeah, but I think Brock Brock's a good I like he's clearly one of the best three quarterbacks in the NFC to me. Um it's it's really not a question if it's an upgrade. I think he's good. Um and you know, system quarterback, it gets kind of a weird tag because like any guy that runs the Shanahan system well is technically a system quarterback. But I mean that can win a Super Bowl. We saw Matt Stafford do that with Sean McVay's system. We're seeing that happen right now where the, the Jared Goff looks like he has a second life under what the Lions are doing. So, you know, it's right. it's it's one thing to be a system guy. It's a it's another thing to be a guy who can't live outside of any sense like it's it's jimmy garoppolo is like hey if one thing goes wrong all right man it's a wrap like he's gonna do something crazy he's gonna throw off his back foot and and fumble six it somehow or, or something like that whereas with brock it's like okay if one or two things go wrong i feel confident about his ability to stay calm and make a play so you know i think that's my perspective of Brock now. I don't watch him as much as 49er fans do. I really only get to watch Brock when he's on national TV. Um, so that's just where my perspective is. But yeah, I think he's he's a good quarterback. And it'd be interesting to see what the 49ers would have been able to do if he were able to stay healthy through that run last year, um, right, especially right. against the Philadelphia Eagles, which to be fair, it wasn't looking good for Brock early in that game. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that was no, just the sure. Eagles being the Eagles, you know what I mean? Yeah, we'll see what happens this year. Also, you mentioned the chat, and so you fired up Lisa again. She says, how dare you talk about my coach? You'll see it blossom this year with Brocky. It's Brocktober. <laughs> so yeah, shout out to Lisa again, always showing us love. You, you know, one, one thing, and, and I, I like Jimmy Garoppolo. I, I thought I thought he did a lot of things well. The 49ers experienced a lot of victory Mondays with him. A lot of victory Mondays. But, but. Jimmy, and you've seen this in, in Las Vegas, has this thing, dude will not throw the ball away. So if there, he, what, what it is, is that trust, that trust problem became an issue when Kyle couldn't believe, he couldn't trust that if he actually called the wrong play, that it would end up okay. If, if he calls the wrong play and, and the other coordinator on the other side has called the right defense against his play, then this is going to end up in a big negative play because Jimmy just will not throw the ball away. And it drove me nuts as much as I, I would. I wanted to see him have success. You wanted to see him do things, but it was like the dude would make a bad play worse. He he would execute. He sometimes make some really tight window throws, get it in there, but dude would just make a bad play worse by throwing a, this ball up there into, into coverage, forcing things. And it's like, I, I don't know how many times I was like, dude, just throw the ball away, man. Just throw the ball away. And you've seen that. You saw that uh, last Monday night with the Raiders playing. He, there's a play. It's not there. It's broken. He doesn't throw the ball away. Throws a pick. You know, that's just that. That was Jimmy with Brock. There was an interesting because there was an interesting graph I saw earlier. I think it was earlier yesterday, and it showed EPA for quarterbacks when the defense perfectly covered every receiver and when they didn't perfectly cover every receiver. When they didn't. Jimmy was was above average. So when when there's open guys, Jimmy was above the league average of what's happening around the league right now with the Raiders. Brock Purdy was well above league average. But when you look at the difference between them two was when their receivers are covered. Brock Purdy was one of the best in the NFL of 
make of EPA when his receivers were covered. Jimmy Garoppolo was well below NFL average. And that really speaks to, I think, what we've seen in San Francisco is when things didn't go well. Now, some of the things that Brock Purdy has done, uh, I will say they they look like he's running off script and he's not. Uh, like, I want to... Talk, I just think about like that first touchdown that we had against Dallas. Uh, George Kittle back the end zone. Brock Purdy, he he climbs a pocket, kind of rolls out a little bit to his right, hits George Kittle in the back of the end zone. Uh, and Kyle Shanahan confirms, I talked about it on my breakdown, that that was the number one on the play, that George Kittle was the number one, that the design of that play was so good by Kyle Shanahan because it, it was perfectly called against the type of defense that Dallas runs. It broke their coverage rules. So to get a favorable route there with from George Kittle, but the protection was breaking down. Brock Purdy was able to buy enough time for that play to develop because uh, Kyle Shannon was asked about that. You see, you know, all, all Brock Purdy's touchdowns last game came outside the tackle box. That was the first time it's happened in the next gen stats era where a quarterback threw four touchdowns outside the tackle box. And, uh, and, and they, and one of the beat reporters asked Kyle, he said, you know, were the all what were the progressions or where, where in the progressions were those different touchdowns? And he said, Oh, all those were number one in the progression. Um, and it's, it's the ability for Brock to not panic, to stay within the structure. And, and then some of them, when he's rolled out, it's, it's not because the, it's not because um, he's panicking. It's because the defense covered everything. Well, I think back to a play during the Cardinals game, he rolled out, found a Christian McCaffrey Cardinals covered what we were trying to do perfectly. He rolls out, still finds it still finds a way to get the ball out and uh that there there like you said there has been a trust level there with brock purdy that i have not seen with kyle shanahan with really anywhere he's been i never saw this kind of trust with with rg3 maybe kirk cousins maybe even even in atlanta with matt ryan during his his uh mvp year when you look at that year compared to what Matt Ryan was doing the rest of his time in the league, Kyle was really managing him that there. He was, he was asking him to throw a lot less deep balls. He was trying to get him to be a lot more efficient. Uh, that year, Matt Ryan threw the fewest deep passes of his career, but was hitting him at a higher rate because they were more strategic. And I, I think what Brock Purdy has brought in here is that his one, his anticipation is just is amazing. The, the, the things that like watching him on film, I, I'm completely blown away all the time. I, I, I said this last year watching his tape. I was like, this does not look like a rookie. This guy looks like he's a five or six year vet. It's crazy. It's like you, you, you don't notice that there's a rookie in there playing quarterback. And that has, and he's even taken his play up a notch this year. And it's, you literally feel like you're sitting there watching a six or seven year vet. Who's completely comfortable in this system and is making some, money throws and and he's operating everything in there and those two together are are being something really special um and and so i i think it's going to be a really interesting test going against y'all's defense because that is i to me not even close to the best defense that we face this year people want to give dallas their flowers they want to you know talk about dallas 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 i get i get sick of that as as, a, as somebody who grew up a 49 ers fan and i hate dallas i hated that <laughs> Dallas was not a physical tough defense. They were not. Uh, they were not a defense that was coming in. They were. They were built to be a pretty boy defense. They're. They're very finesse. They're all about speed and and getting after the passer. And so when you play the Giants, you look amazing because the Giants refuse to run the ball and they're trying to pass it every every play with Daniel Jones. And so yes, your defense looks amazing. Then you run into a juggernaut that's the 49ers. It's physical, and all of a sudden now you look like one of the worst defenses in the league and you give up 42 points. You know, I, I don't think it's going to be that easy against Cleveland this week. Uh, I, I think the way that this matches up is going to be a lot tougher. I think when you when one thing you can tell, and, and we talked about this, uh, was that when you put that on through at least the first half of every game, you've seen Cleveland's defense have extremely high effort, extreme. You know, they're playing hard. They're they're rallying to the ball. They're physical. They are a physical team. You can see it, like you said, the the outside guys, the defensive line, they're physical. They're very talented. Um, the problem is that, that that is the struggle. I think is going to be for Cleveland is can your offense keep you in the game, you know, or not not put the game away for you early? Because um, I, I think I think the def this is the best defense I think the 49ers will face all year. Yeah, I yeah. think. I think that's an accurate uh, way to put it. I think that this Browns defense, even when people were like throwing Dallas in there, I was like, well, Dallas is a little bit different because like they're playing well, but then 
I don't know. You could just see the holes and <laughs> I don't know. I just have this thing with Dallas to where I just don't ever take them seriously because it's just they haven't none of us every do. year. No it, one in San Francisco ever takes them seriously. Yeah, every year it's like, oh, Dallas is gonna do this and that, and every year it's gonna it, it and it's the same story with them. Um and they don't really change out enough pieces for me to think it's any different. They're a very inconsistent team at times, right? Um and you the, the the Dallas that shows up that looks impressive versus Daniel Jones can can be there. But also, you know, you get the Dallas that let Josh Dobbs beat him. Okay, like you know, that was the same defense. So, yeah, I think this Browns defense, like they're very physical up front. Miles Garrett, Zadarius Smith, Dalvin Thomason, and I think Shelby Harris is playing some good football. Maurice Hurst is really playing former uh, 49er. He's playing some really good football. He's staying healthy now. Um, I think that's a really good strong front. And then the, the speed and the aggressiveness of the secondary and these linebackers are – are a serious factor to deal with, especially if you like to do a lot of screens, a lot of dump offs. These guys are fast, they're aggressive, but they're not blindly aggressive. They're smart about it. Um, and I think that they're going to be a tough matchup for anybody. And then you talk about those corners being able to hold up man coverage. I mean, that's the dream, right? I, I joke about it all the time, but I say defensive coordinators, any defensive coordinators running any system, if they could run, they could just man up, keep one safety over top. They will run that system. I promise you. Like, <laughs> you know, um, when you watch Georgia, they they Georgia before they got really good, they were running like three three sixes and all this stuff. And then they got really good at what they start doing five in the box, <laughs> spread them out. You know, it became real easy to coach that defense because when you feel like you have that kind of talent. All of a sudden, you don't need all this if this, then that, you know, zone coverage rules, and you don't need to run these super complicated hybrids. You can just let them let them live, and that's where I think Browns are right now. They're in the rare spots where, you know, I've seen them be able to stop the run with, with five guys in the box at times in the NFL, and all the only other defense I've seen do that recently was the 49ers defense that got Jimmy Garoppolo to that Super Bowl that one year. So, you know, it's it's a real special place to be at. Um, we'll see where they perform. They kind of got hit in their mouth a little bit by Baltimore. We'll see how they respond this week defensively. And also, you know, let's see if this offense, if the offense can put points up early, I think you're, you're really in for a battle because then that's going to be the defense is motivated to keep this thing close. But if the offense looks like they're hopeless, um, you know, this could be one of those things where you can wear them down uh, by, the, by the time you get to like the third or fourth quarter. So it's going to be interesting to see how this game lines out. P.J. Walker, and more than likely, it's not the greatest uh, thing in the world for the Browns offense, but really good defense. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the key. What do you think then is the biggest factor for your road to success in beating the 49ers? Staying ahead of the sticks. Um, the Browns' biggest problem has been just getting behind the sticks. Penalties. Uh, you know, you get a penalty, that sets you back. You get a sack, that sets you back. You... Obviously, you fumble the ball. That sets you back even further. Throw an interception step, steps you back even further. One of the things the teams with bad offenses, and I think Pittsburgh's the best example of that, even though when you guys play Pittsburgh, they didn't do a great job of this. But Pittsburgh has had a terrible offense since like 2017. But they've been able to stay over 500 because they just consistently stay ahead of the sticks. They don't get sacked that much. They, they don't get that many procedural penalties. And they just stay in second and seven third and five, right? All of these manageable downs where they still have their playbook. But when you start taking sacks, when you start um, getting those procedural penalties, you put yourself behind the sticks. I mean, I think what 9% of those drives end up in touchdowns when, whenever that happens. So it's a, those are drive killers. So you got to stay away from the drive killers, play a clean game, um, both without the turnovers, uh, without the penalties, and just stay ahead of sticks. Find a way to get four yards, Four yards every time, um, and, and that'll be through the run game more than likely, through some RPO and through some passing. But we'll see what they're able to do. But that's that's the roadmap, right? Small shortcuts, kind of like how they were playing with Jacoby Brissett. Time of possession is going to be very important. You know, long, ring it out, seven-minute drives. You know, <laughs> that's the kind of football that you're going to want to play. You're going to want to get to the – you're going to want to get to halftime with maybe three possessions, right? Three possessions, four possessions, well, three to two possessions each. Um, and if you're playing that kind of style of football at home, you have a good chance to win any game that you're playing against. But if this is a 
we're having a two minute drive and another one minute drive and then we go three and out and then we move the ball a little bit then we punt then we turn the ball over and it's already the first quarter and all this happened you got no shot you got no shot against the 49ers so that's kind of football game you have to play slow stay on top of the sticks move the ball long drives um and then get points out of every drive right? three or seven uh that you extend past three minutes you know, uh, it's I heard an interesting stat today that actually really surprised me. Did you know the 49ers have not won in Cleveland since 1984? How many times have we played? Not that many. <laughs> not that many. Yeah, not they haven't played in Cleveland. Derek that Anderson beat us that year that he went off. Oh, that was 07. Yeah, that wasn't a was that that wasn't a great 49ers team, if I remember no, correctly. It was not. The last yeah. time we were in Cleveland was 2000. That was early, Alex. That Smith. was uh, that was the Jim Tom Sula <laughs> era. Uh, I think it was Jim O'Neill was the oh. was the defensive coordinator. We're trying to get um, in, a be- in a good mood, Johnny. I'm just saying. Mm. Uh, that yeah, because the there's like now. that. There's that weird part where it's like, okay, you had Harbaugh. They were good for a while, and then Harbaugh, whatever happened, I forget what happened with him. I think he got fired or oh, left. Whatever. He, he got it was fired. A weird, yeah, he it got was a fired. very Harbaugh exit. Um, yeah, he got fired with one game left on an eight and eight season uh, Mm. after he had been the the highest winning percentage of any 49ers head coach since George Seifert um, and got fired. And they they promoted the defensive line coach, Jim Tom Sula, to be a head coach. Uh, Vic Fangio was the defensive coordinator because he got passed over in such an unceremonious way. He left um, and they brought in Jim O'Neill as the defensive coordinator. And like you said, if there's teams that sit there and wish they could watch or play single high man every play. That was Jim O'Neill. Literally, it was press man, single high, every every single snap. They were trying to uh, one and a half gap with the defensive line. It was a disaster. We gave up a hundred yard rusher in 15 of 16 games. It was horrible. Um, and, the, and one of those was to the Browns. Um, ah. that was the last time we played. The Browns. And then there was chip Kelly, right? There was chip Kelly in between. Come on, Quincy. <laughs> Come on, man. I thought we were cool. The chat thought you were cool too. I forgot <laughs> about that. Hey, look, Just we're the team that he bottle. rejected. Like, remember that one where he we were like, chip Kelly's going to be the Browns head coach. And he was like, nah, Philly offered more money. So we, I we wish he rejected us. Chip Kelly. And yeah. then I w- we ended up with Mike Patton and Jim O'Neill. So, you know, I think just Jim O'Neill just haunts around these situations for whatever reason. Oh, but yeah. I hated, I hated watching Jim O'Neill's defense. I hated it. Like every, Ooh. every fiber of my being hated watching Jim O'Neill's defense. I just did. Yeah. Like, that was I think thing. Johnny Manziel beat the 49ers that year. I don't think. We yeah. Played, that Johnny. was a, that was like did, 20. That was a, did yeah. he play Johnny Manziel? Yeah, because it, it was, it was 2015, 2015, and that was that was when yeah. uh, when Kyle Shanahan was there. It was either Manziel or it was Brian Hoyer. It was Manziel if it was 2015, if I remember, because Hoyer yeah. was out by 2014. So, yeah, it was Manziel. I remember that was one, Manziel's one NFL win, and I think that ended no, up like we thought no, it was going to cost. In 2014. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, Kyle left the Browns in 2014. And we, he had also had Mike McDaniel on that staff. And I think that's when he took the job over. I'm not sure. But, yeah, I remember that was Johnny Football, won that game. And I remember thinking, man, it sucks that we won that game because we're not going to have the draft position that we wanted. But it ended up being <laughs> fine. And then we traded back Carson Wentz. And then, like, like we the traded Texans back last to get, year. like, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, to, to get – Cole, I mean, Corey Coleman, and it was some kind of convoluted, goofy stuff that we were doing back then. But I also remember that that was the last win that the Browns had for like two and a half years. <laughs> because <laughs> right after that, I think they uh, they went 0-16 the next year, and I think they won a game the next year, or somehow that, that lined up like that, and it was like, okay, we, we, we hadn't won more than like two games since then. But I think that was with that was Sean like, Kaiser, wasn't it? What the 0 16 season? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was John. That was Deshaun Kaiser. We traded for Brock Osweiler, got a second round pick. Oh, almost gosh, traded yeah, that Osweiler. second round pick. We almost traded the second round pick we got for Brock Osweiler for AJ McCarron because Hugh Jackson wanted him. Sachi Brown sabotages the trade. And you know who that second round pick ends up becoming, right? No. Nick Chubb. Oh. Wow. Fun fact. We almost traded Nick Chubb in theory for AJ McCarron. 
Oh boy. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I, I'm, I, I totally forgot about that Brock Osweiler tra- trade. You know, cause that was like, Brock that was Osweiler. like an NBA style trade where yeah, we traded for the second round pick and they cut him and he ended up back on the Denver Broncos. <laughs> yeah. Cause, cause it was like a salary cap sort of situation. They, they traded him and gave, we need to hit our salary floor. Just, yeah. yeah. Just to, just to, to eat up salary space um in nba style that was yeah i remember people we losing their lives when that stuff. happened of like is this going to start taking over the nfl like did the nba no nah, it didn't look i'm just when but you yeah. look at that 2017 drafts i'm just like glad we like people look at it oh you didn't get pat mahomes you didn't get you know but you're like i'm just glad we didn't make the big mistake because it was real easy to make the big mistake in that draft because after miles I mean, you guys know Solomon Thomas goes third overall, but uh, Mitchell Trubisky goes two. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, look, man, I'll take Miles. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember in that draft, we also, another fun fact, if you want to, my Browns fans are so furious all the time as a team. So we got Miles, fine, 2017, right? We could have got Deshaun with that pick that we had, the 12th pick, but we traded that to the Texans, which ended up getting you Denzel Ward. So it kind of worked out, even though you had to trade three first round picks to get to Sean Watson later on in his career after all the stuff that happened with him. Um, and then you had a late first round pick that I think you traded up for. They take David and Joku. David and Joku's cool. You know who they could have taken? TJ Watt. You know why really? they moved up in front of Pittsburgh? Because Pittsburgh wanted David and Joku. That is that is the rumor that Pittsburgh wanted David and Joku to Browns trade up in front of Pittsburgh to take David Oku away from him because they liked him too. And Pittsburgh goes, ah, they took our guy. I guess we have to take TJ Watt. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Now wow. you can imagine that two ways. One, we created the TJ Watt problem for ourselves, and two, we could have had TJ Watt and Miles. You, you could have had TJ Watt and Miles. Yeah. Yeah. No, that you, you know, and honestly, 49ers fans, super chat here. Getting more love. Bro Montana. Uh, Quincy needs to do more 49ers collabs. Solid show. Um, it, but the, the 49ers traded three first round picks for Trey Lance, right? And mm-hmm. people in that same draft was the same draft that Michael Parsons came out. And people said we could have had Parsons and Bosa, you know, and imagine that duo. Uh, I don't want to think about that hit to the salary cap, but um, of what that's right. going to be here next year. But I mean, that would well, be quite deal the, with the it. thing. You know what I mean? You know? You'll live with it. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, you'll live with it. And when your quarterback's making nine hundred eighty thousand dollars a year, which is a Brock Purdy is, Ooh. you know, uh, I mean, and, and and really what it comes down to when you look at the Browns and the Forty Nineers, a big difference here is is what you're also seeing a lot of teams go to where. You can you can really build a talented team when your quarterback's not having that franchise quarterback contract uh, when you have mm-hmm. them on a rookie contract. Uh, you know, obviously with the Browns being in the situation they were with the un, uh, with the instability and uh, giving all that guaranteed money to Deshaun Watson, it, it makes it harder to improve your team uh, on both sides of the ball. And they've been able to load up on talent on the defense, and in in that regard, the offensive side has been lagging a little bit. Um, some things haven't worked out, but I I think. I think Cleveland's going to be a sneaky team. Uh, I I pick them actually to win the North this year. I really do. I think it's as as they kind of put things together on uh, the offensive side of the ball. I do think that they're going to be the team that comes out of the North. I don't think Baltimore is as strong as anywhere close to as strong as they've been. Um, the Steelers, I think they're they're headed for the worst season they may have under Mike Tomlin. I just don't see how that ship gets turned around at all. I'm not which a Kenny would be Pickett the first fan. Losing season he's ever had. He's, he's ever had. Which is just bonkers Look, to think every about. year. I think that's going to happen with Pittsburgh. They make the playoffs. Like I've been on this. Like yeah. hey, the the I've been telling people that the floor is fall, the sky is falling with Pittsburgh for years, and I'm at the points where I'm like I don't even try to predict it anymore because every <laughs> yeah. time, like the year I was like I was sure. It was the year uh, 2020. I was like, I'm sure this is not a good football team this year. They don't have this. They don't have that. It was all logical. They won 12 straight yeah, to start ben the season. Away. Like I was just, yeah. I, I, I was, I was just blown away. I'm like, I just every time you count Pittsburgh out, they find a way. Like after that 49ers game this year, a lot of people were like, oh, they're done. They're done. They won three games. How? They're not good. I, I promise you, you watch Pittsburgh play and you're not everything that's a good football team but they get these turnovers they are just they are wildly lucky that team is so i just 
Mike Tomlin has made a good deal with somebody or maybe he's like one of the greatest <laughs> people on earth because his luck is incredible and I would never bet against it because, again, look how much worse they are than all the other AFC North teams. They are significantly worse, and you see it when they play them. But they win. Well, we played them, yeah. One or two of those games. Like, it's – it's. I can't explain it. I can't – sometimes Mike Tomlin got something going for him. Um, but, yeah, that should be true about the Pittsburgh. Kenny Pickett's not good. That offense is terrible, like palpably terrible. I mean, they um, can't even get Najee Harris going. Like, Najee Harris is a very good running back, and they cannot uh, get him going. Like, that just says the state of of their offensive line. Like, mm-hmm. they, they're, they're not good. They, they are bad. They are yeah. bad schematically. I've seen Matt Canada run vert at the seven-yard line. Like, they're just not a good football team on that side. of. And defensively, they're leaky. Like they, they they just get these turnovers and it just like with the Browns, they should have lost that game, but Shaw Watson turns the ball over like four times in that game. <laughs> and you can't they should have lost that game against Baltimore, but they just turned the ball over. It's just I wonder what happens to them once they stop playing turnover heavy teams. But I also just sometimes wonder if something superstitious is going on with them because it doesn't make any sense. It it's really doesn't make any sense. Because they forced Brock Purdy to a turnover and and Brock Purdy does not turn the ball over and look what happens we play the Steelers His only turnover on the year of the whole mm-hmm. year was superstitiously to the Pittsburgh Steelers now I'm you. how crazy is that now Mike Quincy, Tomlin living we, right <laughs> we right Quincy man we appreciate you be on the show we want to get you out of here on this what is and chat give us your uh prediction for the game um I will start I will say that this is the first time be also due to some weather concerns that this will be the first time that we are held under 30 points and that we win uh, 27 to 10. I think that's a reasonable, I think that's a reasonable prediction. I'm going to go 21 to, I think the Browns find a way to get like 14. Um, I think the big difference is like, can they force a turnover? Can they get that going? Like they really need to be positive in a turnover margin. It's going to be a tough week to do it. Maybe you catch them off guard because they're like on that high from, from the Dallas game and they're still talking about the T-shirt and you just catch them off guard in the first quarter. Um, that's really the Browns' best hope. I think this game will be kind of decided in the first quarter if this is a seven to ten to nothing game in the first quarter for san francisco they're probably going to win this one if this is a seven to like nothing game for the browns and the browns have a shot to win it um i think that's really gonna determine how things go but yeah i would say i think the browns defense can do a good job slowing them down um holding them underneath uh a certain point i think the offense will be able to get something early i think that'll keep the score down for the total i think it'll be about 21 to 14. I'm not too different. I, I think it's going to be probably a 20 to 10 game. I'm, I'm calling this 2010 49ers just because I think both teams are going to go in and emphasize do not turn the ball over. Uh, I think if you're the 49ers, you're walking into this game and Kyle Shanahan's biggest message is going to be, guys, if we don't turn the ball over in this game, we win, we win this game. It's going to be a tough fight on defense. But I, I, but I think they're going to feel good about their matchup against uh, Cleveland's offense, and they're going to say the only way that they have a chance to put up uh, more than 10 points on us is if we turn the ball over. And so that's going to be a huge emphasis. And I think Cleveland's going to walk in and say, guys, we have no chance to win this game if we, don't turn, the, if we turn the ball over. So we cannot turn the ball over. I think that's going to be the thing, and, and they're both going to look to shorten uh, the game, give fewer opportunities. If you're Cleveland, you do not want to give San Francisco's offense seven or eight drives. You just don't. If you're the 49ers, you're going to look at if we keep Cleveland to four drives in this game, five drives in this game, they're not scoring more than more than 10 points on us. I think both teams are going to have the same philosophy coming in of that, uh, that they believe in their defenses and they believe that their offense, that any, that the best chance to win is if they're, or to lose is if their offense gives the game up. And so I think it's going to be, I, I think, I'd be surprised if, if each team has more than six drives. You know, if you go into halftime and each team has had the ball three times, that sounds about right to me. I think both are going to bleed the clock. They're going to try and and you know, slow this game down and and reduce the amount of drives. So I I, I and I don't see the 49ers, if they have the ball six times, I don't see them scoring, you know, more than two touchdowns and two field goals. I, I think this def, this this Cleveland defense is legit. I think we're going to see the the toughest test of this 49ers team. And Jim Schwartz plays Kyle Shanahan really well. Uh, yeah. Kyle Shanahan has only scored 
more than 17 points against Jim Schwartz once, and that was 23 points. Um, so Jim Schwartz matches up really well against Kyle Shanahan. So uh, I, I think this is going to be the best defensive team we face all year, and I'm, I'm looking at 20 to 10. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Quincy, dude, there's no way that we can only have you on this show this very one time. The chat is has spoken, and so we we will have to invite you back. Do you accept our invitation? Will you come back sometime and kick Man, it with us? Adam I'll be just back loves to put Super people Bowl. on the spot in the show. <laughs> I'll be back. I'll be back I mean, I got to. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Hey, we are definitely hitting you up, so check your DMs, man. We are definitely going to hit you back up because this was so fun. The chat loved having you. They really appreciate your perspective and your zeal for the game, as as do Johnny and I. So thank you again. Make sure, guys, again, the YouTube channel, um, Quincy Carrier, just like it sounds, just like our former backup tight end. Um, and that's what it was, a, a backup tight end. I think the chat confirmed that. So mm -hmm. make sure that you like and follow, share share the channel, share Quincy's channel, uh, show Niner fans our channel, and then say, hey, this dude Quincy was really cool. He knew his stuff, and he kept it real, and it was a great discussion. So thank you to all of Niners Faithful for joining us. Take care of each other. Stay healthy. And as always, go Niners.